Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, my name is Alvaro Watson, and I'm president of Students for Intellectual Freedom. And, you know, like every other campus in America, so too does Temple suffer from a little bit of environmental hysteria, a little bit of envir environmental radicalism, which is known, we all know this. So, um, unlike many of the student organizations on this campus and other campuses, Students for Intellectual Freedom choose to um, extend uh, our forum for another point of view, another stance, another source of information on energy on, in, on, and the environment. So we have invited uh, Americans for Prosperity and um, uh, Energy for America and Energy Alliance. So today we're going to start off with um, Jennifer Stefano, who is the Director of Energy and Labor Policy for Americans for Prosperity, and we'll take it from there. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks. Can you take the mic? First, let me apologize. I don't always sound like an obscene phone caller. I just have laryngitis, so forgive me. Um, and as Alvaro said, my name is Jennifer Stefano. I'm with Americans for Prosperity here in Pennsylvania. Um, to you, just so you know, my background right now, I'm the Director of Policy on Energy and Labor uh, for our state. Two years ago, I was a stay-at-home mother, not involved in politics. I knew what was going on. I was fun at dinner parties. Liberals and I would yell and scream at each other, but I wasn't doing very much to change things. And then uh, in 2008, I realized that is unacceptable on all levels. So I started to change things. And I went out, I run a group here um, around this area called the Loyal Opposition. And I would say, I think that's what all of us, whether we agree or disagree with other as Americans are, we're not enemies. We're opposition, loyal opposition. So um, in that spirit, we're conducting this today. And I know, of course, on college campuses, we like to believe in America. This is where great intellectual debates take place. So I'm open to it. And I know everyone who is here on behalf of Energy Independence is certainly open to any questions or comments, even from our loyal opposition. So if you're here, thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, and so without further ado, I first want to thank Alvaro. He was wonderful and did a magnificent job of helping us and in, in, in getting this through. I know we got a lot of fights across the state from the universities. Um, our way of thinking and ideology is not popular. Of course, the First Amendment doesn't require popularity. It just requires that you be allowed to speak regardless. But it was quite a fight to get here. And it was very difficult to do it. But we felt it was important. So we appreciate that. The Students for Intellectual Freedom, Albert was the president of them. We also thank the Temple College Republicans and the Temple Law Republicans for being here with us as well. So briefly, Americans for Prosperity is the largest grassroots conservative organization in the nation. We teach our activists how to fight on behalf of limited government. And one of our great partners here today is American Energy Alliance, and they're sponsoring this Energy for America tour. And I'd like to introduce their president, Tom Hyle. Tom, thank you for being here. Thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate you all uh, taking some time out of your schedules. Um, I, as uh, president of the American Energy Alliance, we're a nonprofit organization uh, based in Washington, D.C. We're affiliated with another organization called the Institute for Energy Research. And we basically uh, look at policies, energy policies in particular, to determine what impacts they have on consumers, folks that use electricity, that use gasoline, that use power. Uh, what we have concluded um, is that we do uh, have a lot of, because I think there is so much emotional uh, ties to the energy issues. There's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of uh, you know, not taking the time to really understand all the basic facts uh, when it comes to energy, energy production, where we get it, how we get it, and everything. Um, and so we decided to partner with Americans for Prosperity because they have uh, the ability to go out and talk to folks and the grassroots and go to campuses and everything else. And so we have a basic message. Uh, and that message is, and this is uh, not made up, uh, the Congressional Research Service, which is an arm of the Library of Congress, 
uh, which is an arm of the U.S. Congress, has definitively determined that the United States is the largest energy resource base in the world. We have the most energy underneath our lands, underneath our shores, our wind, everything else. If you include it all together, both proven potential and unproven reserves of energy, we have it all. Uh, we can provide our own needs by ourselves with our partners in Canada, for example, um, if three things happen. The first is the federal government is the largest landowner in the United States of America. They own the most land of any, they have a huge uh, amount of land. For example, in California, almost 50% of the state of California is owned by either federal or state uh, government. Uh, states like Nevada, for example, almost 90% of their land base is owned by the federal government. And there are areas uh, in the federal estate that are deemed appropriate for exploration and production of energy, but they're not taking place. Uh, there are areas in the federal estate which you would never want to impact. We're not talking about the Grand Canyon or Yellowstone or anything like that. We're talking about areas that are designated for multiple use, and, and one of those uses is energy exploration and production. 97% the federal land base is off limits to energy production, even though a majority of that land is suitable for energy exploration production. And that is because for years and years and years in Washington, there have been uh, lack of desire uh, in, the, in many cases from either Republican or Democratic administrations. But more importantly, they have placed so many restrictions on those land uh, areas that development is impossible to even begin. And so, uh, for example, in North Dakota, where the majority of the land there is state or privately owned, right now today in North Dakota, production of oil and gas exploration is taking place. There is 3% unemployment in that state. There are 18,000 vacancies in one area alone for jobs. And so. Uh, when you talk about job creation and jobs bills and all this stuff coming out of Washington, uh, you also are, have a situation where the policies that are coming out of Washington are having the opposite effect. They're, not, they're, they're actually preventing job creation from taking place. We're going to hear more about what's happening here in Pennsylvania with uh, the shale gas and the natural gas being produced here and how it's driving job creation driving economic growth, driving revenue for the government to fund the government. You know, royalties on federal land is the second largest source of income for the federal government. The first, of course, is income taxes. Uh, companies pay the government billions of dollars to produce for the, for the luxury or for the ability to produce energy on federal lands. And we're talking offshore and onshore. So, we need to have a more sensible energy policy in this country. We need to, to look at the balance that needs to take place between what we need as a nation and with an eye to the future, there's nothing wrong with looking at alternatives to traditional oil, coal, natural gas production, but it's not to the exclusion of that. Uh, for example, 85% of the energy that we use individual consumers comes from those three sources, coal, oil, and natural gas. Wind and solar provide less than 2%. And it cannot replace those sources. And it certainly cannot do it anytime soon. Uh, there's room for all sources of energy. There's advances in geothermal production, for example. But we cannot be disillusioned into thinking that we can replace coal, oil, and natural gas with those other sources. If you look at the, the disparity between 2% and 85%, it's obvious. Um, so what, I, what our message is, is that we need to take a look at what policies are impeding the production of energy and uh, exploration and production in this country. We need to look to markets to determine the winners and the losers in the marketplace for energy production. 
we're spending billions and billions of dollars subsidizing other forms of energy that aren't producing energy. Uh, and those are our tax dollars that are being spent. Um, one can argue that that's a, that a valuable investment, but when you look at what's happening in other countries where it's been done for a decade, for example, where they're spending billions of dollars, they've spent billions of dollars, jobs weren't created, production of those energy sources didn't materialize, and yet here we are now, those very countries are pulling back on all those subsidies. And our politicians and our leaders are saying, oh, well, they just didn't do it right. But we're doing it exactly the same way that they did. There's no other model. Uh, and so I'm going to turn it over to Anne. I just wanted to say thank you all for coming. I'm available for questions about what energy we have, how energy gets from you know, where it is it's sourced to, to these lights, and to these bright lights, and this microphone, and everything else. And any other questions that you have about, uh, you know, what, what's on your mind about these issues. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And thank everybody else who walked in. There's some food in the back of the room, if you'd like it. Thank you for coming. Um, okay, so I have one technical question. I can just hit it from here. Or do you, have a, do you want me to use a clicker? You can hit it from there. Okay, thank you. Okay, so in general, how many people who are in college here at Temple now, after college, think you're going to get a house, job, car, have a life, be able to buy food, be able to do what you want to do with your money, and basically be able to live as you are now, or possibly even better? That's just a general question I always ask people because, let me just... You know, can I have the clicker? I just think it would be easier. I'm sorry. Apologize. Technical snap. Okay, so I'll just do it here. So basically, I ask this. You know, what? because we, we kind of think about energy and we have a lot of facts and we have a lot of figures, but it's like, well, how does this really affect my life? I mean, if you drill, if you don't know. Yes, there are environmental concerns, but there are a lot of concerns. Energy affects every single thing we do. And one thing I did when I was doing my research and deciding what was going on. Because like all of you, I don't want my children drinking poison water or swimming through sludge. On the same note, I don't want to not be able to, to live in a house, to be able to go and buy food for myself, to be basically starved to death because the cost of energy has driven up food beyond literally what I can afford. And you see it happening today. Everything from college, going to college to buying a soda is skyrocketing, and the underlying cost is energy. So it's the perfect storm coming to us. Your standard of living is going to get even lower, and I don't know how you guys feel, but I feel it's getting low enough as it is. So there's a perfect storm happening for America. We need to be creating jobs. We need to be promoting economic growth, and we need to be reducing our government deficit so that we don't have to keep paying to pay them off. And we need to strengthen our energy security so that we are not hold it to other nations that um, they'll be holding to other nations to get our energy because if another nation supplies us with their energy and they decide they don't like us then they can withhold it from us and if we don't have energy on our own to produce just like if they produce all our food and we can't make our own food we die we absolutely die as a nation as a society and as people so I'm just going to grab my notes to be able to keep going on do you, do you want to here, I'm going to pull it up real quick. Oh. Okay. All right, well, I'm very sorry. I now have, do not have the visual, so I'll go from um, my notes. Apologize for that. So I'm going to hold this up. So evil, rich oil companies. You know, you know the movie Cars 2 came out. I have little kids. And it was all about evil, evil oil companies. Don't think we're quite getting what the word evil means. Okay? Evil is not something that I think companies become or do. People, in general. But these, this is what fuels us. This is what allows us to live. And this is what allows us to put food on our table. And hold on. Do you have it now? Okay, I'll just keep clicking here. Yeah, let's just leave that. Do you, it's not. Okay, 
So, Obama's philosophy is let's tax the evil gas and oil companies, okay? You know, he, he, he said in a number of quotes in 2008, I want the price of energy for all Americans to skyrocket. I want it to go up so high and the consumers will bear the cost. Okay, that was in 2008. And yet, when you think about that, and I know everyone is concerned with fairness, right? So when we're taxing businesses across the board, whether you're taxing a movie producer, people who make movies like cars too, or whether you're taxing the oil and gas industry, they should be fair. So in general, oil and natural gas companies' earnings are well below that of any other sector. Okay? And not only that, um, sorry, man. do you know why two slides are on top of one another? Is that what it is? Yeah. All right, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, now we're going to have a question and answer segment. Okay? So I'm just going to quickly, the slides aren't going to work, so let me go on. Here's the deal. The oil and gas companies are well below. In the first quarter of 2011, right, the oil and gas companies earned eight cents for every dollar. The companies have to make a profit, they don't make a profit, they go out of business. Computer makers, pharmaceuticals, they earn more money. Beverage and tobacco firms, electrical equipment makers, all earned more money than a gas company. And yet the gas companies tend to produce, create jobs for far more people. So how is it that that this sector that pays among the highest effective corporate tax rate employs nine million people. Nine million people can put food on the table for their families, don't have to go out and be hungry and be in need because these guys created nine million jobs. If we crucify them, if we shut them down, who is going to take care of those nine million people? Because you can't tax them if you shut them down. So boom, that tax money's gone. Now you have nine million hungry people who don't have jobs. Who feeds them? GE, okay, they pay less in taxes than the oil companies do. And my answer of why this all happening was, hold it up, it's Obama-style crony capitalism. President Obama is a big proponent of crony capitalism, big time. And here's an example. None of his tax increases None of the things he wants to do affect any of the people who give him money. Hollywood firms, they can keep deducting, but he's gonna stop the oil companies from doing it. Hollywood doesn't employ as many people as the oil company. The newspaper and the media that are biased in favor of him, they are not getting any excessive taxes. Banks, banks, Obama's number one donors came off of Wall Street. Goldman Sachs, okay? comes off of Wall Street, gave him $1 million in 2008. No Republican got that kind of money. I'm not saying the Republicans don't take money, they do too. President Obama took the most. His top bundlers were from Wall Street. Goldman Sachs, Citibank, J.P. Morgan, all were his top bundlers. That's why they're not getting taxed. It's crony capitalism. The banks receive all sorts of special loss treatments. They get bailed out. Anyone here get bailed out? Oil companies don't get bailed out either. High tech and pharmaceutical companies, big contributors in general to the Democratic Party under Obama, still get to deduct all their costs. So my motto is Obama, Obama style crony capitalism. It's you pay, so Obama's buddies do not have to. And it's killing us. Average individuals, it's killing us. It is going to kill you and anything you ever want to achieve in your life if we continue to go this way. And here's the remarkable thing. In the state of Pennsylvania, we have the answer. We discovered oil in Pennsylvania. 4% of America's oil reserves are here in Pennsylvania, okay? We are also one of the top coal producing states and we also have the mighty Marcellus Shale. Are you guys familiar with the first Marcellus Shale? Sure you are. Okay, the mighty Marcellus Shell could provide energy to America for literally the next 100 years. It would be you, your jobs, in your state, in your homes, in your communities, that could literally drive this for us and drive it home. We could go from this unemployment rate of 9% and we could get it back down to where it was almost zero. And it could make our lives better because this food that I struggle, and I know many of you struggle to either feed yourself or for me to feed my family that costs so much money now, the, to fill my tank of gas, that could all change for us. 
and Marcella Shale is a game changer, which is why I invited the extraordinary Ann McElhenney here to talk about it. Now, Ann, I saw her speak before thousands of people. She usually will speak before thousands. She agreed to come here because she cared so much about it to smaller crowds, more, more intellectual feeling, because she believes in this type of energy independence. She's a documentary filmmaker. She did a brilliant, brilliant film on the myths and lies behind global warming called Not Evil, Just Wrong. She's brilliant. She's a wonderful speaker. So please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Ann McClendon. Thank you. Hi there. I'm not sure if we're going to have uh, more technical difficulties. You can probably hear me anyway. <laughs> I have, let's see if this works. I want, to, I want to start by kind of giving you my background of how I kind of got here. Um, as you can guess, I've got a little bit of an accent. Uh, um, so I'm Irish, um, and I'm a journalist, and I was a very liberal journalist, actually, working in Europe and believing all the things that liberals believe about, particularly about the environment. Um, and I was working in Romania. I was doing a lot of stories about children. Um, and I did all kinds of news stories, murders, mayhem, you know, all that good stuff. And then I got a story about an evil mining company, gold mine, a Canadian gold mining company that was going to open a mine in Transylvania in a place called Russia, Montana. And, and I went up to, to, to cover that story. I was a freelance journalist, which meant that I, you know, I kind of did stories and got paid by anyone that, that, would, that liked the stories I was doing, you know. And uh, so I went up to the story you know, very much believing that whatever Greenpeace said about the story was true. That was my, very much my default position, which is a very bad thing, actually, as a journalist. You shouldn't be like that. You shouldn't presume to know the, what's going on until you've actually investigated. But anyway, there were two women, a woman from Switzerland and a woman from Belgium, who were representing Greenpeace, defending the locals in this place in Transylvania. Um, um, these two women, and then there were all these stories that appeared in the BBC, New York Times, CNN, everyone had written about this mine in Transylvania and said something terrible was going to happen. And this one, uh, is it working? Oh great. And here's, here's one of the women. Um, uh, sorry. I love this iPad, I just, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how it works though. <laughs> um, anyway, it doesn't matter if you've got that stuff on the side. Here it is, iPad, that's it. That's what I should, is that what I meant to do? The full screen yet? Oh God! Terrible, terrible. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but this woman here. Try that. Try hit which one? The, the top right one with the arrow. I might do it. Thank you. So this woman is one of the Greenpeace women. Um, uh, Stephanie Ross is her name, and she said this. This is the quote from her at the time. This is what she said: "The illegal process of forced resettlement has already begun." So the basic the line was that Greenpeace were forcing people in Romania, people who had lived under communism. You know, which had, a, which had a very big history of forcing people out of their homes. So these were very sensitive issues. So they were saying that people were being forced, illegally forced out of their homes, which is an incredible thing. And if it's true, it's a front page news story. It should be a front page news story. And I was very impressed by that story. I was super impressed by that. And I thought, this is a, this, we need photographs of these people, these victims of Canadians. That Canadians would do that. Illegally move people out of their homes, you know, for gold, like. Um, it just wasn't true. For seven years, I've asked Greenpeace for the names of one family, one, one individual, anyone, who was illegally forced out of their homes in Russia, Montana. It wasn't true. Everything else they said about that mine wasn't true as well. And I am this person from Ireland, up there on the side of a mountain in Transylvania, thinking, oh my God, these people are lying. And I couldn't believe it. And I was stunned. And it brought me on a journey that's kind of weird, and that's kind of how I'm here. So I kind of think it's always good to tell people who you were and how you got to these ideas. And after that happened, we made a film called Mind Your Own Business, which looked at the efforts of environmentalists to stop mining in other parts of the world. And we, we made that film. I'm going to jump back and forth or whatever. But when, when that film came out, people got in touch with us about Rachel Carson. Rachel Carson's an American. I'm sure some of you have heard of her. Rachel Carson was the founder of the environmental movement. She wrote a book called Silent Spring, which was basically, she was basically the Al Gore of her day. She was super, super, you know, popular and everything. Her book was serialized in the New Yorker. And her basic thing in the book was that she was against a thing called DDT. It's a pesticide. It was used agriculturally in America. Um, and she, I mean, used at a level, it was kind of an obscene. People would see clouds of it on the street. It was incredible, unbelievable amount of it was used. But a guy called Paul Muller, who won a Nobel Prize, worked out something else that it could do. 
But if you sprayed it on the inside walls of a person's home, you could save people from malaria. And he won a prize, and he won a Nobel Prize for that, so he was a great guy. But she, she went out against DDT, the use of DDT, and she basically got DDT banned worldwide. The result is about 50 million dead children. Malaria mostly kills under fives. This is what the WHO said about the use of DDT. We must take a position based on the science and the data. One of the best tools we have against malaria is indoor residual spraying of the dozen insecticides. WHO has always proof how spraying is the most effective. So, despite that, environmentalists like bed nets. They love bed nets. They think bed nets is how we're going to save children in Africa. It's, on, it's a lie. Every day in Uganda alone, 370 children die every day unnecessarily <coughs> of malaria. And the reason that they die unnecessarily of malaria is because environmentalists don't like pesticides. So I have an issue with, with uh, environmentalists. But I'm going to kind of rush on, if that's OK, because I kind of want to cover loads of stuff. But I can come back to all of this. Um, so in our film, in my Your Own Business, in the first film, we interviewed the head of the World Wildlife Fund in Madagascar. This is what he said about poverty. And this is why I have a problem with environmentalists. You know, how do we perceive who is rich and who is poor? I could put you in a family and you count how many times a day that family smiles. Then I put you in a family well off in New York and you count how many times people smile and measure stress. Then you tell me who is rich and who is poor. And he's talking about people in Madagascar whose children die before their fifth birthday. I think I know who's rich and who is poor. Um, so I, I became very sensitive to environmental stories. And when people say extraordinary things about the environment and how awful oil companies are or mining companies are, or any of that stuff, I'm really sensitive to it because I've met so many of them that lie. And so I'll give you an example. At the moment, people talk an awful lot about the oil sands. I don't know if you've heard about the oil sands in Alberta. Environmentalists call them tar sands. It's an incorrect title. They're called oil sands. Things should be called what they're called. Let's not make up other names. Anyway, the oil sands of Alberta, it's marvelous. It's Saudi Arabia next door. They don't stone women up there. Anyway, they've made about five documentaries, five documentaries saying that the Alberta oil sands are really bad. And the big point, one of the big points they make in that documentary, in those documentaries, is that people, the people who are living there, indigenous people, so really poor people up there, are being poisoned by toxins produced by the oil company. That's a strong story. That's a good story. I think that's a great story. And this guy, Dr. John O'Connor, God between us and all harm, a man from Ireland, and look at him with his lovely facial hair. Now, doesn't he look awfully appealing? And this guy reported, and has reported wildly, of five cases of the very rare clogangio carcinoma, which is a really, really rare cancer. Five, a cluster, in this area because of the oil sands. And he also reported very dramatically about the death of a man that he had, uh, he, one of his own patients, a 33-year-old man who died of colon cancer. He's been featured in five documentaries. Department of Health in Canada became very interested in Dr. John O'Connor because of what he said. Because clearly a cluster of cancer is something that they need to be aware of. So they got in touch with him and asked him to send, their fi him to send his files. Please send the files of these terrible things that have happened. Please, 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 please. He made it up. He made up the 33-year-old. He made it up. And that man is quoted, if you look online right now, go on Google right now, he continually gets quoted by environmentalists to prove why the oil sands is bad. I have a problem with environmentalists because I don't like liars. And so we come to Gasland. Gasland was nominated for an Oscar. It has won multiple Emmys. The money shot in Gasland is this. It shows a man putting a light to water, which then ignites. It's super dramatic. These are the Markhams and the McClures in Colorado. Unfortunately for Josh Fox, the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission, which is a state-run body, examined the water at this house and at the McClure's house and found that yes, the water could light. The water could always light. It's called biogenic methane. It's organic. It's in the soil. You are living in a country that's energy rich. This is the stuff that happens. And, if you, and, and it's really funny, we confronted Josh Fox about this. I'm a documentary filmmaker. People hate me. But you know the one thing that they can't do? I have never had to factually correct one thing I've published. Never. I'm proud of that. People say I'm a bitch, but that's fine. You can call me a bitch, but at least I'm telling the truth. We went to Josh Fox and said, don't you think you should mention the fact that those people could always like their water? Don't you think that's relevant? He said, it's not relevant. It's not relevant. I think it's relevant. And I think it's 
relevant that we have towns all over America called Burning Springs. Burning Springs. Look at this one. Half a mile west in 1669, Seneca Indians brought Robert Cavalier, whatever, to see water that burned. Afterwards, the spring became a mecca for explorers. This is nothing new, guys. They've been burning the water all over America forever. So I don't like people who try to scare people. Don't scare people. Tell people the truth. And stick close to your truth. The truth is beautiful. And the truth is easy. Just tell the truth. In his film, he also talks about the Dunkard Creek Pennsylvania fish kill, caused again by fracking. It's not true. Not according to the EPA, it's not true. I mean, I'm quoting people here that hate oil and gas. The Environmental Protection Agency said it wasn't caused by fracking. It's still in Josh Fox's film, and he doesn't correct it. I don't think that's good enough. And then we have, I'm really sorry, I am really bad at this iPad, so that's really small writing. That's the head of the EPA, Lisa Jackson. You're worried about contaminated water caused by fracking. Well, she says that she is not aware of any proven case where the fracking process has affected the water. <laughs> you know, I'm quoting the EPA here. I'm not, this is, these aren't my opinions. And the other thing that Josh Fox puts in this film is he goes to Dish, Texas. And he enter, Dish, Texas is a hyster hysterical town in Texas that changed their name because they all got free cable. <laughs> And they call her a dish for 10 years, they're going to get free cable. I mean, I think fine, I, I'd love free cable for 10, for whatever, 10 years. Anyway, they have this guy called, this guy here in the photograph is the mayor of Dish, Texas. He appears in Gasland to explain that because of fracking in the area, the people there are all sick. They have benzene in their blood and they have carcinogens in their blood caused by fracking. That is really strong stuff and that is a powerful thing. So the Texas Health Department were really concerned about that. So the Texas Health Department went to, te went to Dish, Texas and analyzed the blood and urine of the people living there. Four people in Dish, Texas have benzene in their blood. Those four people are smokers. If you smoke, you will have benzene in your blood. The rest of the population, according to the, the Health Department in Texas, the rest of the population had levels of all oh, whatever, everything that we have in our blood, the same as the general population in the United States. Did Josh Fox include that in his documentary? No. Do I think that's good enough? No, I don't. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and that's just the stuff there. The Texas Department of Stealth found that the exposure to contaminants by residents of the dish was not greater than that in the general U.S. population. You can get all that stuff online. Those reports are all published online. And then just to kind of bring us on, I know some of our earlier speakers kind of mentioned this. I think this is really important. Let's look at energy. Yeah? Energy, is, energy is life. Wherever you've got electricity, we live long and prosper, and it's great. And guess what? You should go and visit Africa and see what it's like when people don't have electricity. It's crap. It really is crap. It's awful not having refrigeration. You have diarrhea all the time, and that's the least of it. That's the absolute least of what happens there. You know, try it. Try that organic back to nature, back to the past. Try it. There's people living in it, and my God, they'd cut their own hands off to have a bit of the American dream and to live here with all the progress that we have, where people live, in, live to be 95 and no one thinks that that's special. I actually genuinely met a guy recently, I swear to God, in California, and he was a quite old looking, and he kept talking about his father. And I said to him, Who, what, what age is your father? And he said, my father is 100. And my father, he said, has just had his 100th birthday, and the guys that he hangs out with, the guy, by the way, his father drives. And he said, the, guy, the guys his father hangs out with, you know, were so excited about the father being 100. They phoned the local newspaper to take a photograph of him. The local newspaper said it's not a story. Phone back when he's 105. Only in America. Only in America, and that happens because of power and, and electricity. Here's the way that energy is in America. Basically, everything is fossil fuels. The bit that's not fossil fuels, and that's really good and works, is nuclear power. Who doesn't like nuclear power? Environmentalists don't like nuclear power. On the side over there, yeah, that's all the renewables. The most reliable, the best renewable there is, absolutely reliable, hydroelectric power. Who doesn't like hydroelectric power? Oh yeah, 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 you guessed it. <laughs> environmentalists don't like hydroelectric power. I think environmentalists like the idea of turning the lights out. Impacts. A big word with environmentalists is the word impact. Everything has an impact. Well, here, I have news for you. Everything has an impact. It is true, and everything has a footprint. There is no such thing as a free lunch. So if you love windmills, you have to understand and know that they kill 300,000 bird, 300, birds in America a year. It doesn't bother me, by the way, but it does seem to bother environmentalists, but they don't seem to remember that when it comes to windmills. 
Also, windmills only work, only work with a backup power source. The backup power source is evil fossil fuels. Make your choices. People really like windmills as well. Here's a kicker about windmills. Windmills are made, a huge, they need a huge amount of copper, a huge amount of copper. Guess who doesn't like copper mines? Environmentalists hate copper mines. They absolutely hate copper mines. And you have made a discovery, by the way, in Alaska. There's a place up there, I'm going to think of the name of it in a minute. But they've made a discovery of a huge amount of copper. Which pebble we could, mine. Pebble, there you go. The pebble mine, guess who doesn't want the pebble mine to open? You know, bring it on. Solar panels, impact, impact. If we continue at the rate of acceleration with solar panels, there will be, there will be an increase of lead poisoning in the air of 33%. But it's, you know, but make choices. And by the way, I have to tell you this because I think it's so funny. Somebody did a survey of people who have solar panels in California. And it's very, this is a kind of an interesting kind of psychological little thing. I just think it's kind of fun. The people in California have so, hold solar panels. Most of them choose to put them on the, on, the, on the side of the house that's visible from the road. Even if the side of the house that's visible from the road is north facing. <laughs> but I love that. That's how I say that. Um, impact. Everything has an impact. This is one of the founding fathers of environmentalism, Paul Ehrlich. He continues to get praised today. He says there's too many people on the planet. And on the anniversary of the seven billionth baby, woohoo, I'm delighted the baby was born last week. On, the, on her anniversary, look at what Paul Ehrlich said in his incredibly famous book, The Population Bomb. The battle, he, sorry, published 1968. The battle to feed humanity is over. In the 1970s, hundreds, you know, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. At this late date, nothing to prevent a substantial increase in the world death rate. He's an environmentalist. I have a problem with environmentalists. People still listen to this guy. People listen to this guy. This guy, this guy is a, has tenure at either Stanford or Berkeley. I have a problem with that. This man is wrong. This is not true. He's wrong. So we should say that. I think we should say that. And by the way, impacts. I love this. I just want to throw this one in because I think it's worth putting in there. And I, I'm kind of open to kind of loads of questions afterwards. I love this one. A lot of people are really into the idea of the pill, and the pill really saved women, and it's great, and all that kind of stuff. The pill, basically, is causing male fish to become female fish, and female fish to become male fish, and all kinds of nonsense to be going on at the waters. And you know something? I'm really amazed environmentalists don't talk about that, because they're really talking an awful lot about impacts. But there's some impacts they like, and some impacts they don't. They love what they call organic, local, and indigenous. Nothing is more organic, local, or indigenous than American natural gas. Excuse me, a hundred years of it, how great. Coal is local, organic, and indigenous, along with heirloom tomatoes and whatever. But oranges, are oranges organic, local, indigenous to the United States of America? Not so much, they're actually from South America. Sweet potatoes, not so much. So. You, got, you know, I just think it's kind of, not, I think it's good, let's call organic, you know, if you're really into organic, local, indigenous, then be into all of organic, local, indigenous, don't be, don't be kind of choosing winners and losers, you know. And my energy policy, just to very quickly say about my energy policy, I, my energy policy is air conditioning and cold beer. Uh, it is also artificial hips, iPads, washing machines, heart transplants, flush, flush toilets, and death at plus 90. And I can tell you, it's very, very simple to bring up a map of the world and shade in the places that use loads and loads of electricity. And shade in places that don't use loads and loads of electricity. And then on top of that, add in places where people die really young. And those two things go together. So I believe in electricity. I believe in electricity. And electricity comes from fossil fuels. And even though you might wish for renewables, and I'm all in favor of renewables. I'm in favor of anything that's cheap. I love the idea of not paying for power. I think that's a great idea. But anyone who tells you that this country can maintain the standard of living that we have, where we live into our 90s, and give up fossil fuels, this is not true. It's just not true. And by wishing things doesn't make it true. We can wish all kinds of stuff. I wish all kinds of stuff. I wish I was richer. It doesn't make it so. It doesn't make it so. And I think, I hope, I hope some of this stuff has been interesting to you. My point has been, in my life, what I've experienced is that environmentalists lie, and I don't understand that. If you have a good story, tell your truth and tell it aloud. Don't lie, because if you lie, I don't trust you now. I don't trust you on anything else. 
So the people who are against the Marcella Shale, the people who like Josh Fox, why do we fill the film with lies? Why? Why do that? If it's bad, let's, let's hear about it, because everyone cares. No one wants pollution, no one wants children dying, no one wants an explosion to happen next door. Who wants that? Just tell your truth and tell it loud. And I'd love to take questions. <laughs> One of the reasons I asked Anne to come speak, I think the brilliant line she gave, she was giving a speech and she said, the pill, to, she was talking about women in Africa who have to walk, they want, what were, Anne, you should tell. It, it, no, I would say that, I would say that, I say that, you know, rather facetiously, a lot of people talk about the pill liberating women, and I actually question that. I think what really liberated women, and I am super serious about this, is the washing machine. If any of you have been to Africa or India, women devote their whole lives whole career to washing clothes. It takes them three or four days a week. And I think that's an insult to women. Those women could be finding a cure for cancer, not wasting their time washing clothes. So I think the washing machine is an extraordinary thing, and I am not being comical about that. I look at my washing machine, I just think it's the most amazing thing. You put in dirty clothes, they come out, and they come out, and American, American washing machines, by the way, are better than ours in Europe. They come out so quickly, and they come out dry, and they're clean. It's like, this is insane. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Hey. Just, let me bring you. May I ask you Yeah, that's, I want you to just be heard. Oh, shout it out. Yeah. Shout it out. Okay, well, I can do both. Hi, yeah. Um, I'm not going to do this. So, uh, I really liked your talk. I thought it was really informative. Um, I learned a bunch of things that I didn't know, actually. Like. I didn't think that the pill was responsible for fish having three eyes or male fish becoming women fish or, yeah. I don't know, what I was under the impression was, was that, you know, it's our, you know, there's a number of things. I know that one of them is the meat industry and how we pump our animals full of hormones so they can, you know, so cows can stay pregnant and so they can, you know, keep producing milk and how that gets into the, into the water system. And also, um, another thing is, I never really realized that the washing machine was so much more liberating than the pill. And I also never realized how connected the first world of the United States and the third world of Africa were so connected like that, you know? And like, I never really thought about how, you know, my iPad... Could we have a know, question? I, I really appreciate the question, if that's possible. Oh, no, no, yeah, my thanks. question is, like, I just want to know what you think about, I guess, the first world's activities and how they relate to the third world and where energy comes in, like, comes into the equation there. And, like, maybe if you ever, like, considered how, you know, all the U.S. and first world countries more or less raping the DRC, raping Sudan... What's the raping DRC? Democratic Republic of Congo. They produce raping a lot the DRC. of... Oh, let's, let, can we slow down a minute? Because there's things, a lot of stuff in there. Yeah, yeah I'm okay. sorry. I'm just, I'm just really surprised from everything. No, can we, can I, we, I want can to thank I, you. Can I answer, though? Because yeah, I, I don't I'd, think... I'd, I'd love to okay. hear it. So, number one, you didn't know about the fact that the pill affects the waterways, and you think that millions, can I just, at least let me answer, yeah? So millions and millions of women take the pill, and obviously, everything moves on, <laughs> and uh, it, 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 uh, it's interesting you don't know about that, but it, it, you can find it on the internet. It's not something environmentalists like to talk no, about. No, no, I was being facetious. I know that, you know, hormones go into the water, but I think that it's really short-sighted to see it only as a woman's issue because only women take the pill. No, I didn't say it was a women's issue. I didn't say it was a women's issue. No, I said, no, I just said, I said, everything has an impact. I yes. said everything has an impact. Yes, but you forgot to mention, you neglected to mention other things that the first world does that have greater impact than women taking the pill, like our meat industry, yes. like okay. our okay, entire so I think, I, Okay, can we just, can we do this, can we do this this way, because I think it's fair. I think it's fair if we have questions and I get to answer. And I think I actually have the honor of being asked to be a speaker. And when you're a speaker, and I have the honor of listening to you, and I really appreciate. Well, I thanks very much. I, by the way, can I, one thing I forgot to say: my my name, if, it's, if you can spell it, if, if it's written down somewhere. If you, I'm at Anne McElhaney is my Twitter handle, and my Facebook is at Anne McElhaney. And I love, or, I'm sorry, not at my my Facebook is Anne McElhaney. Please write to me. Anyone who doesn't get a chance to say something tonight or today that that, that they wanted to say. Um, First world and third world, turn, I'll tell you what I think the relationship between the first world, I think the really abusive relationship between the first world and the third world is rich people from the first world who go to the third world as charity workers and impose the most appalling values on those people there. The values of anti-capitalism, 
They go from beautiful places like Connecticut, where they have had the benefit of a beautiful capitalist system. And they go to Africans and say, oh, you wouldn't want what the Americans have. Well, I can tell you, I've spoken to very many American women, or, or African women, and African men, and this is exactly what they want. And they don't want a basket weave. And they don't want to live indigenously, and they don't want to live locally. They want to travel, and they want to have a flush toilet. They want to have what we have. Anyone who thinks otherwise, I think, is a racist. And I think it's very interesting the number of people who go to Africa and say, and basically treat Africans like they want something different. And the bed nets is, is my perfect example for that. How dare they? Oh, yeah, the idea that the idea in America, can you imagine here in, Philadelphia, in, in Pennsylvania? If 370 children died every day of, of malaria, do you think we'd be using DDT here in Pennsylvania? I think so. Can we but, take a, sorry, can, I think she, we should move yeah, on. She, next question. The woman next to you has a question. And guys, yeah. just ever, if any of a question, put up your hand, and if I see you, I'll come back. You just talk. And then if nobody has a question, we'll come back if you have a second question, but go ahead. Um, so, it's, I do agree with you that there's a huge trend for you know patriarchal and cultural imperialism that comes through like mission missionary uh, adventures and stuff like that. But you spoke a lot about saving children in Africa, and also about creating jobs for the American people. And we referred a lot to the sense of we, like we need a, a higher standard of living. We need this and that, and like energy efficiency. They're not quite. They're not quotes of mine, by the way. But that's I, fine. I, I didn't talk about jobs. I never talked about I'm, jobs. I'm, speaking to, else I'm sorry, I'm speaking okay. to the entire panel. So no, I, I, I did. It's fair. I didn't address that. That's fine. Yeah. Um, and talking about like the next 100 years being good, um, I have two questions. One in, in terms of longevity, where are these jobs after the 100 years, um, what happens then? Like, what is the, what is the, okay, and sorry, two I'd questions. I'd love to answer that. that that's, that's fantastic. What happens after 100 years? They'll work it out. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, I have, such, I have such faith in people. My God, I mean, we have Steve Jobs. They'll come up with something else. Do you not think 100 years is a long time? I think 100 years is a long time. It's a century. They'll come up with something else. The, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. We came up with another idea. Well, if you We're at, always doing that. We come up with new ideas. We're great. And if you look at Pennsylvania alone, uh, you know, we discovered oil here in Titusville, Pennsylvania. They said then that they were going to run out of oil, and mm -hmm. then they discovered it in Texas. That's right. Ten years ago, 15 years ago, they said that uh, we would be running out of natural gas, and natural gas prices were high. And technology, the technology that came along to directionally drill for the, for the gas in the seams underneath our ground right here in Pennsylvania is a recent technology that has created an explosion of natural gas, which, by the way, makes natural gas cheap. It makes it cheap so that people can heat their homes, so that people can cook with it. You know, it's it's technology is going to be the deciding factor of what the next thing is, or the next hundred years, or what what happened. That's and it could be in some of these emerging energy sources, or I would argue that it will still be coal, oil, and natural gas. And also, just as Anne pointed out, if we can, if we can, again, it's all sitting under the ground. And imagine, as we do this, it's not just America that will benefit, but the rest of the world. And as Anne said, those women and men in Africa who could then get electricity, get energy, live longer, be educated, build a house, imagine what they will find in 100 years. They're untapped resources. They will be the next Steve Jobs if we don't continue to oppress them. And let me just keep going. I know you have follow-ups and stuff, but... Yeah, like what do you think is like the major thing um, preventing the federal government from investing in nuclear power? Is it environmentalist groups like Greenpeace, like lobbyists, or like what is it? Because I live up near Limerick, PA, and the nuclear power plant there is awesome. Everyone there loves it, and it's it's a tremendous source of energy and broader jobs for the area. Yeah, I, I can answer that one. Um, it's quite interesting. If you look at the history of when they built nuclear plants in America, the last... The, they haven't built a nuclear plant in America since Jane Fonda's China Syndrome. That's the power of Hollywood. So people have been terrified by stories about nuclear power that aren't true. And so they just stopped using them. So I think, the, I think it's the power of public opinion. But the public opinion is getting told things that aren't true. That's the problem. Um, so getting the facts out, I mean, I'm a, big, a huge believer. But you'd think environmentalists would be in favor of nuclear power. It's CO2 neutral, it, or it doesn't emit any CO2, which obviously means CO2 is not really the big issue with them. 
And uh, there's a couple of specific things as well. The, the, it's incredibly cash. There's a lot of investment capital that needs to go into a nuclear plant. There's a lot of liability issues. And there's another issue that's very interesting. The federal government took responsibility from the private sector and, and charges nuclear companies, utilities, to maintain a repository for spent nuclear fuel. Okay, for the for the stuff that is now there's some technology out there that you can reprocess it, but by and large you have to store it somewhere. They have yet to finish the job on that. For 20 years, they've they've basically been struggling with where to put it. So a lot of people don't want to invest because there there's not a lot of certainty, thanks uh, in large part to the federal government. Um, there was a gentleman, and I see you, and in the time, sir. I apologize, I came in a little late, but uh, how do you propose the market takes into account negative externalities uh, associated with the use of fossil fuels? Do, do you want to give me, give, give me some examples? Uh, for instance, uh, the increased temperatures caused by the use of fossil fuels and how that is affecting various people that have nothing to do actually with the use of Okay, the temperature has not increased for 15 years. This is the height to decline that Michael Mann talked about. This is what climate gate was all about. So they there is not the correlation. Climate. Let me just finish because I was asked a question. Um, the, the correlation between CO2 emissions and rising temperature is at the very, at the very, very least highly disputed. Highly disputed. So you know, so the, so the idea that we would give up, I mean, the idea that we would give up the, the fuel that is keeping us alive, I mean, I just think it's an incredible, I think it's, I think it's all, it's all very, it's all very romantic and interesting to talk about renewables. It can't be done. Not, like, people seem to be ignoring science, ignoring the truth, ignoring how we live. Look where we're living, look at this place, look at this room. Do you understand we're burning electricity here? This is coal. If you don't like coal, you shouldn't be sitting here. You should be in a hovel somewhere in the dark. I mean, people are very funny. It's a very funny thing that, I find that really odd. You need to really look around your world. Look at your own world. Look at the way you live. How you got here today. What you do, what you want to do with yourself. Have you traveled? Have you ever been to Paris? Do you want to go? You know, let, there is a cost. Yes, there's a cost. But we are, we are paying, we're very happy to pay that. I think most people are very happy to pay that. But the people who aren't happy, still pay. And I don't get that, because you could opt out. You could opt out if you think we're all about to die. And the people who think we're all about to die, like Al Gore, lives in more than one home. He says living in more than one home is a disaster. Who, is, who are these people? Rajendra Pakutri, the head of the IPCC, another guy who thinks we're all about to die, flew from New York to Delhi to watch a cricket team, not a game, to watch them practice. How dare they talk to me about fossil fuel use? These people are idiots. Come on now, get real here. And get real about your own life. You are not living off the grid. You are not living off the grid. And I have, not, I have yet to find someone who is really living off the grid. Who, when their mother is dying in a hospital in Ireland, they don't get on a plane immediately. Who doesn't go so... Tell the truth about your life. If you think we're about to die, get off the grid. And I will, I, and I myself, I will promote you. I will say that you're a sincere and wonderful person. But I'm not meeting any of them. Ma'am, I never meet any of them. You, you, you gotta do it in fairness. It's his fairness. Look, here's the deal. You talked about rising temperature. Rising temperature caused by CO2. This is not a fact. It's not a fact. We, we, unfortunately, we have another event. It's great, and I want everyone to get at least one question in. If we can double back, we will. Okay, hold on. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. And then the I would like to know your website. Well, the last film we made was called Not Evil, Just Wrong, and so the website is notevildustwrong.com. Uh, dot com. I'm sorry, say it again. It's notevildustwrong.com, but my Facebook is Anne McElhenney, and I write every day, and people uh, My name, A-N-N-M-C-E-L-H-I-N-N-E-Y. <laughs> I can write it down if you so. Did you want to add? Any other questions? I got a lady, a lady back. I'm going to bring a mic. Actually, I believe that they have introduced the usage of DDT back in America. 
here in America? I think they have reintroduced the use of DDT back in the United States. No, unfortunately not. Oh, I've heard that. I, I wish they would, because you know who would be the first customer? I would, because I have termites. And my other question Not is, personally, I don't have termites. My building has termites. <laughs> these, um, these big natural gas typhoons, um, through the Superfund and through the Clean Water Act, they are not um, obligated to tell you um, ingredients that they use in the hydraulic fracking. Stop! No. Stop! Go online right now to Frack Focus. Frack Focus, I think it's called frackfocus.org. All of the ingredients of all of the fracking fluid in every well in the United States is available online. Every well. And that's another thing, by the way, that Josh Fox has in his film, it's just not true, but there you go. Frack Focus. It's not run by gas companies. It's a state-run, you know, whatever, federally, whatever. It's an independent body. And all of the frack fluid ingredients are there. I can bring it up for you right now. Let me do that, actually. Let me show it to you right now. Let me do that, because I think it's useful for people, you know, because people just say stuff, and it's just not true. I'm sorry, the between the people that are getting sick from the What people are getting sick? There's actually, you're right, there's no correlation between the that are using the fracking and the people that are actually getting sick um, in the Marshall's for um, Shell. Who's getting sick? They were just saying that people are getting sick from... People can say whatever they like. It doesn't mean it's true. Yeah. I saw gas. I'm asking the question about the, Please. the fracking. Um, She's saying that people are not getting sick from the um, from the hydraulic hydraulic fracking going on, and that there's not a correlation between um, the people that are saying the so that they're so called getting sick and the correlation between the ingredients in the in the fracking. I'm trying to answer the question in general, and uh, just a lot of people got in Pennsylvania. The narrative is dominated by gas lands. It's just dominated, so anyone who watches that movie, it's just for truth. And unfortunately, nobody goes and reads, but I think these are good questions because you're sitting here shaking your head like, oh, there is a site. The idea that this country does not put out what is in the fracking water is a lie. You talk about being lied to? Josh Fox is lying to you. Did everyone get that? It's all here. Can you see it? Yeah. Guys, any well in Pennsylvania, the Department of Energy website, you can find where every well in the state is. You can go to the site, you can find out it's exactly what is in every single fracking water that goes down in the ground. Okay, hold on. You with the other, their hand up. Okay, so I think you, the, you first and then you. Yeah, you can. Oh, okay. I, I want to touch a bit upon um, this gentleman's comment about externalities. There are a lot more tangible externalities than um, just like this, I, this debatable idea of climate change, whether or not it's increased directly related to um, to the use of fossil fuels and such. So externalities are also in terms of unjust and unproportionate. Um, let's say I'm, I'm familiar a lot with the mountaintop removal process uh, in Appalachia. And one of the externalities is that a coal company can go in and accrue all of these, um, all of these dues. Like, let, I know that there is one. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name right now, but it's 6.5 billion dollars. They get charged one million dollars, and the town has to make up for the rest of it. Not to, not to account for the fact that roads are being destroyed. The fact that these, there's, they've accounted for 65,000 tons of coal to be carried. They've just increased the size of, the size of. Um, caravans to carry this up to 120,000 pounds. And so what this does is it, it essentially ruins the infrastructure and it ruins the roads. And then who pays for that? Does, do you have record of like coal companies going in and accounting well, for that? I, I'm not, let me go first because I can never follow you, man. <laughs> You're so passionate. When you talk about externalities, uh, I get it. Uh, there are uh, issues with, uh, ex there are negative externalities. But you're also ignoring the positive externalities that these resources have provided. The roads that you talk about are built with asphalt, which is a petroleum product. The, the fact is, is that with externalities, you look at life expectancy in this country versus countries that don't have the energy to heat their homes. Run, you know, 40% of India still isn't electrified. And they're an emerging, developing nation. 
when you talk about externalities, and there, are, you know, there's bad apples in every everywhere, okay? including the environmental community. Um, when you talk about externalities, you got to remember that these resources are have made our life possible. And so I understand that when you see an isolated incident or a company, maybe there, you know, there's, there's structures, there's regulatory structures in place that probably aren't the best, most ideal. But it doesn't take away from the fact that these energy sources are incredibly important for our lives and should be taken into consideration as you, you know, talk about other things. So that's what I'll say. About. And do you have any? Can I just add a, a little bit? Um, I guess that my concern is. Again, in this in this reference to the like the general public, the we that is benefiting from this, we're not all paying for that. These communities are directly being affected in impoverished areas, and this general like idea of the environmentalist being against all of these things is I, I find it personally a little bit offensive because I, I don't hate all of these things that I've been proposed to hate by aligning myself as an, identifying with environmental movements. So. Well, communities, I, we were, one of our bus tour stops was a town called Craig, Colorado, a town of 8,000 people. They have two main sources of employment in that community, a coal mine and a coal plant, okay? What do you do when, if, I mean, I would argue, based on my discussions with the town people there and the mayor and everybody else there, they would be dead. That community would be dead without that mine. They would not have... Uh, just, they wouldn't have job creation, any jobs at all. They'd be moving, for example, a lot of Colorado residents are moving to North Dakota because they're in the energy business, but Colorado happens to be a place where the federal government doesn't allow for exploration and production, whereas North Dakota is because it's private and state land, as I mentioned. 18,000 people, there's vacancies in, in North Dakota for, for energy jobs. So, you know, I mean, it goes both ways in terms of the community impacts. And did you want to add anything? Oh, yeah, um, about mountain top removal, um, I, uh, which happens in, where is that, what state is that? West Virginia. West Virginia, West Virginia yes. I have been there, I have been there. And uh, they're not mountains, they're hills, number one. The Appalachian Mountains are hills? Well, they certainly look like hills to me. Let me just make a point. Let me make a point about where I saw it. Let me make a point of what I saw up there, because I just think it's interesting. What I saw in West, West Virginia was an extraordinary number of these kind of hills. Loads of them, like loads and loads of them. The whole place is pockmarked with them. And where people have done this mountaintop removal thing for coal, when they're done, when they're finished, what they've done with that land is amazing. They've, had, they've built schools. There's like a golf course on one. The land has actually become really, really wealthy because everyone wants it because it's been flattened. Um, and I, I was quite surprised that it was something I hadn't seen. West Virginia is a place where people, there's been, it, has a, it has a history of an awful lot of poverty. An awful lot of poverty. P people have had really hard times there. Um, and have, have had a great problem getting jobs. What they have in their local area, it's very much like what happens in Africa, by the way. People use what they have in their local area to make themselves rich and to make themselves have a better life. And that's what people in West Virginia have done. They have mined the coal. And I think good luck to them. You know, why not? Because I like electricity, and they like electricity. My question is regarding, I, I grew up basically in Appalachia around uh, Mountain Top Removal, and I just saw the positive effects that it had on our community in regard to job creation and, and uh, sort of the overall culture in a very, very poor area I grew up in. Um, so my question is in regard to, you know, outside of... Just say your question. My question is regard uh, outside of Mountain Top Removal, um, are there other energy resources, and we talked a little bit about Marcel Shell, but I'm thinking specifically, you know, offshore drilling and some others, other things that are having sort of a positive effect um, that sort of regulations, I know that the moratoriums on offshore drilling and other issues, can elaborate on sort of outside of being the Apple, you know, Apple <coughs> Sure. I mean, we've got the ability to produce oil, uh, energy resources off every uh, every coast, uh, but we're only allowed to look in three percent of, of a small sliver of the Gulf of Mexico. Virginia, the state of Virginia, is asking the government to allow them to look for oil and gas offshore. There's a prospect in North Carolina called the Manio Prospect that could produce a huge amount of uh, natural gas. You look at the Bakken Shale, the Marcellus Shale. You look up in Alaska, um, you know, there's a place, talking about Burning Springs, there's a place in uh, California where there's natural seeps of oil that are tarring the beaches. Now, that's not oil that's being spilled by 
human beings or tankers or drilling uh, platforms. That's natural seeping oil that's spewing out of the ground. There's a, a place in Santa Barbara, outside of Santa Barbara called Coal Point. So, I mean, like I said, we have more resources under our, our shores and our lands than any other nation, including Russia, including Saudi Arabia. Um, we just don't have policies in place that allow us to access it. Yeah, um, I just have a question for all of you. Um, I guess what scholastic credibility do any of you have? Just coming from a place of having, you know, been in college for a really long time and taking a bunch of environmental studies courses and knowing that, you know, climate change is real and a big part of climate change is, you know, the United States is, um, I guess, uh, gluttonous, consumer-driven, you know, um, abusive, oh, exploitative lives. The, and you're I mean, I've, I've heard these things gluttony. from, um, And this know, is what you're being taught. This is called brainwashing, by the way, but anyway. Brainwashed. You're being brainwashed. My, my I'm sorry, I just want to prove global warming. I just want to know. I just want to know who's just proved global warming. Because not the 98% of climate scientists I've heard talk about. Okay, hang on. Let me answer. Let me answer that one. Let me answer that one. Let me answer that one. Okay, you're, you're in college, so I'd say logic will work beautifully with you. If we say that 98 percent, no, please, sweet, because actually, I, this is an important. At this point, I really love doing. It. So let's. No, no, I can't take anything you said seriously because you said that washing machines were more liberating than the birth control pill. You don't know anything. You are the least credible human being I've ever like encountered. Be my African. I know that this is I absurd. Have, I'm I'm not, like, I just can't help it. I'm, I'm sorry, not an but you're a goddamn idiot. Yeah. A goddamn idiot. You are, and you're lying through your teeth. You and how speak? does it feel? What, the, what? What am I lying about? Those good news tell the truth. What Did am I lying about? I've been to Africa. What am I lying about? You've been to Africa. I haven't been to Africa, but that doesn't mean that oh, I don't know. Oh, but you've been out of Africa. No, she has a different opinion about Africa. Infant mortality rate in Philadelphia are just as bad as place in Africa, all right? Say again? The infant mortality rate in black and brown communities, like in North Philadelphia, is just as high as in many places. Okay, that is factually inaccurate. But can I just do? Can I just do? Can I just do one point? Because I think it's worthwhile. Um, even though I've just been insulted, personally insulted, which I think is an extraordinary thing for intelligent people to do if she was talking about academic background. That's not what an open-minded person does. But let's just look at what she said, because I think it's, worth, it's really worthwhile. So she said that 98% of scientists agree that global warming, that global warming is a major problem, basically. That's what she said, 98% of scientists. Everyone in this room is going to college, so you're going to like the logic of this. If you say 98% of something, there must be a hundred percent. So somewhere there must be a list. There must be a list of all the scientists that exist. My first challenge to this lady is to give me the list of every scientist that exists in America, in the world. Because if they do, that's how you can use the word 98%. If there isn't a definitive list, there is no such thing as 98%. Number one, logic. Number two, science does not proceed by consensus. Science is not democratic. At one time in history, it was the consensus that the earth was flat. Everyone believed in that. Everyone agreed on that. One man said that that was not true. One person is true. The idea, anyone who says to you, the majority agree with it so it's true, is not a scientist. I don't know what they are, but they're not a scientist. The laws of gravity do not get agreed by a consensus by a vote, by a de democracy. It's, science is not democratic. Science is about truth. One person can be correct. The person who quotes 98% of science is somebody who already knows they're losing. So they are using illogic. 98% of all scientists, unless you have a, an index of all scientists. Richard Lindzen, Chair of Atmospheric Sciences at MIT, says we need to not worry about this. He was on the IPC, he resigned because of the fact that it was so unscientific. The list of scientists that I think is running to about a thousand that I've seen a list of, who dissent with the other opinion. It grows all the time, but it doesn't really matter how big the list is. It doesn't matter. Because the truth is the truth, and it's not done by majority. We can't all vote in this room about the laws of physics and it make it right. And I would like the lady who insulted me earlier to at least acknowledge my logic, at least acknowledge that logic, because she is obviously a highly educated person, although I question that. 
Anyone who needs to insult, anyone who needs to use ad hominem attacks against the speaker is someone who is obviously really shaky on their facts. Hit me with facts, girl. But I mean, when you have to go down to the personal attacks, you're obviously really losing it. You're going to give me the list then of the 100%. So you have a list of every scientist that ever lived. Not a list. The book isn't really that big. But um, I do have some notes about the uh, IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Intergovernmental, in, not interscientific. Inter it's a governmental panel. It's not scientific. Yes. Um, yes, it is. And uh, it was evaluated research from over 130 countries. Great. Um, some of them were actually uh, part of the European Union. And, you know, the European Union... Mean? Uses, what about the European Union? Like, I'm just saying they use a lot of really great, um, I don't know, really um, great what? sustainable energy. Oh my god, okay, stop. Windmills, stop, we have to uh, stop you on that. In Spain, do you know what the unemployment rate in Spain is, where they have this wonderful, which was a poster child for renewable energy, Spain? They have over 20% unemployment. And how many of them have health care and get to eat food all the time because their government takes care of them? Just curious. Yeah. Enlighten me. Well, I, yeah. I can tell you one thing. You'd be, you're about the only person in the world who thinks that the European experiment is a success. The they, are, they have no money. They're being bailed out by everyone. The whole thing is falling to pieces. And she, look at her. My God, you need to read a newspaper. You have got to be informing yourself. Whoa. The European Union are about to crumble. The U Euro is about to crumble. Are you aware of and that? And the US dollar is doing so good right no, now. It's doing a lot better. You it's doing an awful lot better. Europe is falling to pieces. You do know that now, do you? Do you don't you? That? You know that they're rioting in Greece. In Greece, people retire at 50, and they can't continue to pay them. Greece has no money. You do know that. You do know that. You know that in France, there is an incredible problem. They're spending more money than they have. You do know this. Ireland, where I'm from, we are in such bad shape, we have had to give over the sovereignty of our country to the IMF. The IMF had to come in to run Ireland. Do not sit here and try and explain to people here that Europe is a success. You are one girl in a million who's going to believe that. The whole world is acknowledging that the European experiment was a mistake. Well then what experiment worked? The American experiment! Yes. The American experiment! Yes. Oh my God. Let me make a point tonight. God bless America. This is the only country. Everyone's trying to come here. I don't think Cubans are stupid, by the way. Cubans swim with sharks to get to this country. And, and they're drilling for oil. Yeah. Uh, they swim with sharks. I, I mean, that's hilarious. This is amazing. Europe. Oh my God. The I United have, States of America. I want to quote them. People on die. They hide in trucks and vans. They give their life. They give their children to come here. And you think we're fail? The read the newspaper. Do you not read these articles? The European Union, literally. Are there any other questions? Okay, any other questions? Any other questions? Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Anyone who wants to write to me, by the way, my name is Anne McLean. It's on, I'm on Facebook and I, I respond to everyone. I always respond to Yeah. Hi there. Hi. 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 H
Uh, you're referring to the 